All right. Um, so I'm Katie Corvey. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Auburn University. Um, and we are working on a study to look at how policymakers in the South consumed and acted on scientific information um, over the past year in the context of COVID-19. And so the PI on the project is Dr. Kelly Dunning of the Auburn School of Forestry and Wildlife. Um, and we've also been working with Dr. Williamson, Willoughby, and Zadi at Auburn, and also Dr. Parrish Bergquist from Georgetown. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, and so to frame our study, um, we have been using the policy regime framework. Um, it is um, from the uh, public administration literature, and it seeks to explain um, and identify the different things that are in play whenever there is a policy regime. In this case, it would be the response to COVID-19. And so um, this slide kind of outlines work that was um, done by two scholars in the field, Carter and May, and this was published last year. Um, and this framework, um, they kind of did an initial assessment of COVID-19 and then we're building on it by um, looking at what the response has been in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so this framework theor theorizes that poli policy responses to major issues such as the pandemic include ideas, institutions, and interests. And ideas are the concepts that become the foundations uh, for policy. So in our case, we're defining the science of COVID as our ideas. Um, as these are the basis for guidance, um, mandates, et cetera, in the response to COVID. And then we have institutions. And so these are the federal, state, local agencies and organizations um, that have responded to COVID. Um, we're particularly interested in what their actions have been. And we are looking at both their individual actions and um, collaborative actions. And then finally, you have interests, which are uh, the different political actors who push for different um, policy approaches um, during the response. And so um, the second box of each of these three kind of shaded areas um, kind of outlines the findings of Carter and May. And as we kind of go through the next few slides, you will see that we are finding um, very similar things. So we have uh, three components, three major components to our study. The first is an analysis, analysis of policy documents. Uh, the second is interviews with decision makers. And the third is a public survey. And so for the policy document analysis component of the study, we've been uh, collecting policy documents from federal, state, local agencies, other organizations um, who have played some role in the COVID response uh, for our three states. And so these documents um, can include official agency guidance, general website content, news releases, um, press conference, write-ups, um, any kind of other information that is out there that can help us to understand um, what ideas have been communicated, who has been doing it, what have been the roles of the different institutions involved, um, and what are the various interest groups that have influenced the response in the three states. Um, and so we're kind of in the early stages of this um, for ideas. We found that generally information has flowed from federal agencies down to state agencies and then on to local agencies uh, and organizations. And that states have, in general, developed plans from federal guidance. Um, they are incorporating CDC data, but also their own state level data. And then these plans are operationalized um, at both the state and local level. For institutions um, to date, we've found that um, there was a reduced response capacity at the federal level, and that this caused a lot of confusion and delay in response. Um, and it has led state and local actors to really take responsibility um, for creating and operationalizing uh, their policy responses um, for COVID. And uh, for the interests, um, sure it's no surprise that political uh, polarization has just really hampered uh, the response. And so we are picking up on that as well. And the second component um, is interviews with decision makers. And so um, these are also federal, state, and local um, organizations. And so I'm talking with um, different state and local health departments, 
governmental offices, uh, governor's offices, mayor's offices, um, local um, uh, organizations like educational institutions, community organizations, hospital systems, chambers of commerce, media representatives, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to get a fairly broad uh, representation there. And so in general, we found again that uh, the information has flowed from the federal level, but many of the local organizations in particular are prim primarily relying on state level um, data to develop their policy responses um, as they just feel that it's more appropriate um, for what they're trying, trying to get done. Um, agencies are sharing scientific information, so virus characteristics, risk, uh, different behaviors that people can engage in to try to slow the spread, but they're also sharing resources such as um, links to unemployment information, uh, small business loan information, et cetera. And they are doing it by every medium that you could imagine. Um, and so general, in general, uh, in terms of trust, that's come up a lot in the interviews. Um, and there's been a real focus on building uh, trust at the local level and also capitalizing on trust that is already there at that level um, to really kind of operationalize and facilitate the policy res um, responses that are coming um, from all levels of government, really. Um, and so uh, we're also asking them about their challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that has been talked about by so many of our participants um, is the inability to effectively counter misinformation um, it's for many reasons, just because it spreads so rapidly. There's a huge volume of misinformation, the politicization of the entire response. Um, and also the promotion of misinformation at the federal level, uh, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic last year. Um, another big thing they're mentioning is uh, information management, again, just because of the sheer volume of the information that's coming out, um, that the information has changed over time, just as the response um, and situation has changed. And also just this sense of burnout in the population um, in terms of how much uh, information about COVID we're expecting people to uh, consume, internalize and act upon. And then in general, um, just this widely held belief that COVID has highlighted existing societal issues, uh, racism, politi uh, politicization, disparities in health, education, income, access to resources, um, and that those are the things that we really need to focus on in order to better deal with um, situations like this in the future. And then the final component of the survey is a public, or of the study, sorry, is a public survey, which will be rolling out in the next few weeks to adult residents of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so we'll be asking them where they're, asking people where they're accessing information about COVID, um, from all levels of sources, federal, state, and local. So we've included major news outlets, local outlets, mayor's offices, local radio and TV, um, agencies like CDC or the state or local health department, social media individuals, such as uh, including former President Trump and President Biden, people's personal physicians, religious leaders, families and friends, employers, et cetera. Uh, the crux of the survey um, are experimental questions that we're going to use to examine public trust and information that's provided by different levels of government. Um, and so we'll have messages such as guidance on COVID mitigating uh, behaviors that people can engage in, and we will attribute those messages to various institutional actors from the different levels of government, and then we'll gauge participant response um, to that presentation of the information. Um, so we're kind of excited about that. Um, and then we'll also um, ask about support or opposition to various mitigation me measures, as well as any personal behaviors that people have or have not engaged in to control the spread of COVID. Uh, and then of course, we will be uh, collecting demographic information so that we can analyze uh, our responses by the different subgroups of respondents. So that's a very quick <laughs> um, overview of what we're doing. I have to acknowledge all of the students who have helped us uh, so far with this project. Um, and these are the references for the policy regime framework if anybody is interested in that.